Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Nalak Hadich Nungar Mort, KN Kardak Nijabudja. We acknowledge the Nungar people as the original custodians of this land. The Lord be with you. And also with you. This morning begins the great week of the Christian year. During Lent, we have been preparing by works of love and self-sacrifice for the celebration of the Lord's death and resurrection. With Christians throughout the world, we come together this week to call to mind and to express in word and action the centre of the Easter mystery, our Lord's Passover from death to life. Christ entered in triumph into the holy city to complete his work as Messiah, to suffer, to die, and to rise to new life. Today we commit ourselves to walk the way of the cross so that, sharing his sufferings, we may be united with him in his risen life. I think you're all going to hold up a palm cross. God, our Saviour, whose Son, Jesus Christ, entered Jerusalem as Messiah to suffer and to die, bless these palms to be for us signs of his victory, and grant that we who bear them in his name may ever hail him as our King and follow him in the way that leads to eternal life, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Mark. Glory to you, Lord Jesus Christ. When they were approaching Jerusalem at Bethphage and Bethany near the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the village ahead of you, and immediately as you enter it, you will find there a colt that has never been ridden. Untie it and bring it. If anyone says to you, why are you doing this? Just say this, the Lord needs it and will send it back here immediately. They went away and found a colt tied near a door outside in the street. As they were untying it, some of the bystanders said to them, what are you doing untying the colt? They told them what Jesus had said, and they allowed them to take it. Then they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks on it, and he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road, and others spread leafy branches that they had cut in the fields. Then those who went ahead and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our ancestor David. Hosanna in the highest heaven. Then he entered Jerusalem and went into the temple. And when he had looked around at everything, as it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Let us praise Jesus our Messiah, as did the crowds who welcomed him to Jerusalem. Let us proceed in peace. In the name of Christ. Amen.
merciful God, as we enter this holy week and gather at your house of prayer, turn our hearts again to Jerusalem, to the life, death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, that united with Christ and all the faithful, we may one day enter in triumph the city not made with hands, the new Jerusalem, eternal in the heavens, where with you and the Holy Spirit, Christ lives in glory forever. Amen. Let us pray. Everlasting God, in your tender love for the human race, you sent your Son to take our nature and to suffer death upon the cross. In your mercy, enable us to share in his obedience to your will and in the glorious victory of his resurrection. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. A reading from the book of the prophet Isaiah. The Lord God has given me the tongue of a teacher that I may know how to sustain the weary with a word. Morning by morning he wakens, wakens my ear to listen as those who are taught. The Lord God has opened my ear and I was not rebellious. I did not turn backwards I gave my back to those who struck me and my cheeks to those who pulled out the beard. I did not hide my face from insult and spitting. The Lord God helps me, therefore I have not been disgraced. Therefore I have set my face like flint and I know that I shall not be put to shame. He who vindicates me is near. Who will contend with me? Let us stand up together. Who are my adversaries? Let them confront me. It is the Lord God who helps me, who will declare me guilty. All of them will wear out like a garment. The moth will eat them up. Hear the word of the Lord.
A reading from the letter of Paul to the Philippians. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness. And being found in human form, he humbled himself, and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God had also highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bend in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Hear the word of the Lord.
In the holy name of the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. It is a great joy to come home, um, and I'm completely grateful to the presenter and to the Dean for the opportunity to come back to the city Perth where I've spent so many years of my life 
and to have the opportunity to walk through this experience of Holy Week with you this week. Um, Steve assures me that if I swim in the ocean every day, my jet lag will disappear very quickly. It's great to be here. You are sitting this morning on a pew in a cathedral church that is in a country in which for thousands of years people have told stories. Stories about things that happened in the past that explain why things are the way they are now. These stories make sense of things that don't make sense otherwise why the beds of rivers curl round, why water sometimes falls out of the sky, and why rainbows often appear afterwards. As such stories are told over many generations, they are refined and adjusted to fit changing circumstances, and they become overlaid with current events that either shine new light upon or obscure earlier meanings. Today, on Palm Sunday, we have gathered together on these pews in this cathedral church to, sell us, to tell a set of stories that come from another country, today known as modern Israel, that comprise part of our, history, our Christian heritage so that we accept them also as stories that explain our experience here to us. Already this morning in our readings and singings we have heard a wide collection of stories, almost too many to take in at once. Together they comprise part of the rich tapestry of story that we will embrace over the coming week. Today is a kind of gateway just as Jesus entered the gateway of Jerusalem on the first Palm Sunday, so this morning we enter the gateway of the story of Holy Week, Christianity's great story. Over this coming week, we will not only tell and sing and listen to that story, but each one of us will live it out in our daily lives. We will literally walk the Holy Week story, culminating in the climax of the Triduum or the three great days, Friday, Saturday and Sunday. Christian liturgy for this week helps us to know the way on this walk and it is possible, if you choose, to participate in liturgy here in the cathedral every day this week. In this way, we not only remember and commemorate, but experience and participate in the story of Christ's passion and resurrection. Now, please don't think that I mean to be disrespectful by reducing the events of Holy Week to a story. Precisely the opposite is true. I have a very high theology of story. We are story-making creatures and stories shape our world and everything that happens in it. If you want a contemporary example of the power of story, you need look no further than the lands of Israel and Palestine, today engaged in bloody battle that is the result of a clash of stories. Israel has a story, support for which comes to some extent from our biblical heritage, but that's a whole other sermon, that God gave the land to their ancestors and thus to them. While Palestine has a story of the land that belonged to their ancestors from which they have been and are being forcibly removed. We, as Christians, just happen to be more familiar with the first of those stories and the historical privileging of that story over the Palestinian story has led to the events that we today witness with such horror and helplessness. 
So, stories matter. They shape what happens in our world and they explain what happens in our world. I wouldn't be surprised if you were feeling a kind of sense of narrative whiplash this morning, tossed about between the joy and celebration of Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem that we heard read on our way into the cathedral, and Matthew's account of Christ's suffering and death that we heard sung so beautifully by the consort as our gospel reading. There is a venerable Anglican tradition of telling the story of the climax of Holy Week at its very beginning, alongside the very different story of the week's celebratory beginning. It is a way of orientating us both to our place in the story now and to the surprising and confounding place to which the story is inexorably headed. There is another venerable Anglican tradition with which we have dispensed this morning. You will no doubt be relieved of making you stand through the entire thing. That sense of narrative whiplash is perhaps no bad thing as it offers us something of a window into the experience of the disciples and the other earliest followers of Jesus in the first Easter week. The story as we have it, in its various versions in the four gospel accounts, is full of confounding events and complicated emotions. I can only imagine how completely baffling, contradictory and devastating those events must have been to the first Christians. In some senses, Palm Sunday is the most straightforward of the parts of the story, and yet it is riven with ironies. The people are portrayed as triumphant as their leader enters Jerusalem as a king, a new David waving palm branches and shouting Hosanna. Yet Jesus is riding not a mighty stallion, nor a royal chariot, but a humble donkey. Meanwhile, Jesus himself knows that his purpose in entering Jerusalem is not an enthronement, but that he might suffer betrayal and a painful and humiliating death in order that his suffering servitude to his father's creation might bring about its redemption. If Palm Sunday is set about with ironies, then the events of Friday and Easter Sunday must have felt to those first witnesses simply incomprehensible and utterly defeating. Only Jesus had some grasp upon their meaning towards which it was left to the gospel writers to grope. What do people do when they are faced by events that are overwhelming in their confusion? They look back to the stories they have told in the past in a hope that those stories might shine some light on new events. You might have experienced this in your own life when some challenging events such as illness or death of a loved one or the breakdown of a marriage shatters your sense of who you are. You look to the stories you have always told about yourself to remind yourself that just as you navigated past challenges, so you will navigate this one. And you retell those stories in new uh, ways so that the identity that they support can go forward, integrating this new challenge into an enriched sense of self. This is what the Gospel writers did. They looked back to their stories. And their stories were the stories of the Hebrew Scriptures, our Old Testament. And these stories help them to navigate their way through new ones. 
We know that they did this because we can see traces of the Hebrew scriptures all the way through the gospel accounts. Just in the gospel account that we heard sung, we see places where Matthew incorporated older stories. Sometimes he claimed that the events of the crucifixion happened in a certain way so as to fulfill what had been foretold, such as the refusal to rip apart Jesus' clothing and the casting of lots so that his robe might be retained in one piece. In other places, he simply placed words of the Hebrew scriptures upon Jesus' lips. So those devastating words... Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Are the opening words of Psalm 22. Today, in many churches, including this cathedral church, that same psalm is sung or intoned on Monday, on Maundy Thursday, as altars and sanctuaries are stripped in preparation for Friday liturgies. Similarly, Mark, in attempting to navigate between the triumphalism of the entry into Jerusalem and the ignominy of Jesus' approaching fate in the first Gospel reading that we heard this morning outside, turned back to the Hebrew Scriptures for inspiration and found the ideal precedent. He quotes from the prophet Zechariah, Rejoice greatly, O daughter Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter Jerusalem. Lo, your king comes to you. Triumphant and victorious is he, humble and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. In this way, Mark does two important things. First, he manages to hold together both the majestic and the humble dimensions of the story. Secondly, he brings to the story all of the contextual history of the first. Zechariah was prophesying in the wake of the destruction of Jerusalem and the exile of its inhabitants to Babylon. Here, he imagines the return of the exiles to Jerusalem and the restoration of a king to the throne of David. The first of these, the return, proved in time to be a terrible disappointment, while the second, the restoration of the king, failed ever to materialize at all. All of that context, that initial hope crushed, is woven into Mark's account of the entry into Jerusalem. It's worth relaying, just because it's fun, that when Matthew incorporated this same passage from Zechariah into his Gospel, he was so concerned to capture its essence that he portrayed Jesus as riding two animals at once, both the donkey and its foal. One of the things that made Israel distinctively different from the nations around it was that it told stories about its greatest disasters. We all know the aphorism that history is written by the winners, but in Israel's case, that wasn't so. Israel wrote her defeats. And that meant that the Israelite writers of the gospel had a treasure chest of disaster stories to draw upon. And that was important because the most prolific periods of biblical writing, both in the Old and New Testament periods, were those periods following Israel's greatest disasters. The Gospel writers, possibly with the exception of Mark, were writing in the years immediately following the destruction of Jerusalem by the Romans in the year AD 70. They don't necessarily tell the story of that destruction in their Gospels, but the impact of that experience makes itself felt strongly. Ironically, the greatest disaster of the Old Testament period also involved the military destruction of Jerusalem, this time by the, by the Babylonians. I referred to it a moment ago when I was talking about Zechariah's prophecy. 
As a result, when Jerusalem was destroyed a second time, Hebrew scribes were able to look back to the earlier stories to help to navigate the disaster. And when Jesus was subjected by the Romans to the indignity of death by crucifixion alongside petty criminals, those same scribes were able to look back to their earlier stories to help to make sense of it. One of those stories was Isaiah's story of the suffering servant, one instalment of which was read this morning as our Old Testament reading. Scholars, who love to argue about everything, are not completely in agreement about just who Isaiah's suffering servant might have been. And indeed, there may have been more than one model. But one of the prime theories is that the servant was that group of Israelites who were exiled from Israel and taken to Babylon by the Babylonians. Isaiah's writing about them has a sense that although this group suffered greatly and obediently, their suffering eventually proved to be redemptive for Israel as a whole. And so Matthew and the other gospel writers borrowed this image as a kind of shorthand way of telling their readers who Jesus was and what his suffering would achieve. Over the next week, it is my great privilege to have been given the opportunity to walk the Holy Week stories and all of the stories that stand behind it with you. I've been asked to offer a particular focus on trauma. And so as we watch this week traumatic and confounding events continuing to unfold in Israel and Gaza, we will be taking trauma as a focus for our telling and walking of Israel's earlier stories and our foundational story. I hope that some of you will accept the invitation to walk those stories together here in the cathedral. And I wish you all a holy and a meaningful Holy Week. Hosanna, Hosanna to the Son of David. As we face up to the costly loving shown by our God, let us approach him in humility and pray to him now. O God, give us in your church undivided hearts to love you and one another and go on loving through insult and praise, through acceptance and rejection in the sure knowledge that you are Lord. Make us strong. (coughs) O God, may the kingdoms of this world soak up the values of your kingdom. May their leaders and their peoples uphold what is right and just and establish a social order which is rooted in godly love. Make us strong. O God, in all the heartaches and joys of human relationships, may we be governed by selfless love, faithful and forgiving like you, without limit. Make us strong. O God, draw alongside all who suffer, that they may know the comfort of your presence 
and the healing power of your forgiving love. Especially we pray for those who have sought the prayers of our community. Percy, Alex, Riker, Frank, Alma, Chuan, Ellen, Eben, Alice, Jackie, Patricia, Mark, Kerrily, Arthur, Peter, Mel, King Charles III, and Catherine, Princess of Wales. Make us strong. O oh God, we pray for all who are making that last journey of death, that they may be surrounded with your peace and rest in your love forever. We give thanks for the recently departed, including Ivor Smith Cameron, priest. And we remember those whose year's mind falls at this time. Ian McLeod, Philip Ware, Les Good, priest, Tom Pollard, Margaret Bartlett, Joan Holroyd, and Jill Paul. Make us strong. O oh God, we give you thanks that the Messiah has come to save your people. Almighty God, you have promised to hear our prayers. Christ has reconciled us to God in one body by the cross. The peace of the Lord be always with you.
The Lord be with you. And also with Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. All glory and honour be yours always and everywhere, mighty Creator, ever living God. We give you thanks and praise for your Son, our Saviour Jesus Christ, who became obedient unto death, even death on a cross. He offered the one true sacrifice for sin and obtained an eternal deliverance for his people. The tree of defeat became the tree of victory. Where life was lost, their life has been restored. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we proclaim your great and glorious name, forever praising you and singing. Merciful God, we thank you for these gifts of your creation, this bread and wine. And we pray that by your word and Holy Spirit, we who eat and drink them may be partakers of Christ's body and blood. On the night he was betrayed, Jesus took bread. And when he had given you thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup, and again giving you thanks, he gave it to his disciples, saying, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me.
Therefore we do as our Saviour has commanded, proclaiming his offering of himself made once for all upon the cross, his mighty resurrection and glorious ascension, and looking for his coming again, we celebrate with this bread and this cup his one perfect and sufficient sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. In faith we acclaim you, O Christ. Renew us by your Holy Spirit, unite us in the body of your Son, and bring us with all your people into the joy of your eternal kingdom. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, with whom and in whom, in the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, we worship you, Father, in songs of never-ending praise. As our Saviour Christ has taught us, we are confident to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains just a single grain. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. If we have died with him, we shall live with him.
the gifts of God for the people of God. Come, let us take this holy sacrament of the body and blood of Christ in remembrance that he died for us and feed on him in our hearts by faith with thanksgiving.
Let us pray. Loving God, our help and strength, through these holy mysteries confirm our faith that by the death and resurrection of your Son we may walk in the way of salvation. Most loving God, you send us into the world you love. Give us grace to go thankfully and with courage. In the name of the Holy Spirit. Grant, merciful Lord, to your faithful people pardon and peace, that they may be cleansed from all their sins and serve you with a quiet mind through Jesus Christ our Lord. Christ our Saviour, draw you to himself, that you may find in him crucified a sure ground for faith, a firm support for hope, and the assurance of sin forgiven. And the blessing of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord in the name of Christ.